On this Monday night, Ontario's heart-wrenching hunger crisis. This is an emergency. What the inability to afford food is leading to. People are talking to us now about taking their own lives. Unprecedented displays of dissent and defiance in China. As Canada begins pivoting away from trading with Beijing. Somber visit. The Prime Minister honours victims of the Saskatchewan stabbing rampage and the millions in funding for an Indigenous community. Plus, brain power. I think that the possibilities are truly endless. The innovation allowing children to control machines with their minds. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The lead up to Christmas is always a financial strain on many families. And this year, the pressure is as basic as it gets. The latest hunger report in Ontario reveals the scale of the reliance on food banks. There has been a 64% increase in first-time users of Ontario food banks since before the pandemic. Rising food prices are making it impossible for low-income people to afford to feed themselves and their families. And it's leading some people to reach the breaking point. Mike Jorlet has our top story tonight. As CEO of the Mississauga Food Bank, Megan Nichols deals with need every day. But that need has evolved into a crisis, the likes of which they've never seen. In the past two weeks alone, she's fielded five calls from clients seeking help in ending their own life. So people are so desperate, they're coming here for food, but then they're asking you about assisted suicide? Yes. That's, you're having people ask you yes. about assisted suicide? Yes, yes. That. I, when I say that this is an emergency in the community, people who are living at the bottom income percentile in our community are talking to us now about taking their own lives because it's too hard to be poor any longer. A new report from Feed Ontario paints a grim picture. 587,000 people visited Ontario food banks a total of 4.3 million times over the past year, a 42% increase since 2019 the sixth consecutive year where there's been a hike. Also worrisome, one in three food bank users are seeking help for the first time. And it's not just an urban issue. The food bank in Iqaluit reports demand has increased 12% every month this year. Last summer, summer of 2021, we averaged between 100 to 150 meals per day. Right now, we're seeing between 400 to 500 meals per day. It's the same story in food banks across the country. More people are visiting more often. Add rising food prices coupled with a decrease in donations and it's math that doesn't work in their favor. Put another way, Feed Ontario says inventory that would normally last two to three months is gone after two to three weeks. Donors who would normally um, give to the food bank and support financially no longer have um, that available income to, to support it. And in some circumstances, um, donors have turned into actual food bank visitors. Long term, they'd like to see changes to social assistance and minimum wage. But as people's desperation grows, if donations don't increase, they worry they could be fielding even more crisis calls in the near future. Mike Drolet, Global News, Toronto. Now to the extraordinary unrest on the streets in China. Public protest there is swiftly quashed by the communist regime. And tonight there's a heavy police presence in Beijing and other cities, an attempt to keep people from expressing their anger. Officers were seen looking at individual phones. There are reports they're checking them for VPNs and deleting images so they can't be posted to social media. Support for the protests is spreading. People in Hong Kong have used white sheets of paper and flowers as a sign of solidarity. And around the world, demonstrations have also taken place. The protesters in China want an end to the COVID lockdowns, but are also demanding the rule of law, freedom of the press, even the downfall of Chinese President Xi Jinping. As Mike Armstrong reports, it is testing Xi's ability to control the population. This is different. There are protests in China, but not like this. If they happen, they're local, maybe a demonstration over pensions at a plant or pollution. These protests are national. We have a sense now that people have the same grievance against the regime, and that's new. Fatigue over China's drastic zero COVID policy turned first to frustration and now to anger. Where most of the world has moved on from lockdowns, they're still as rigid as ever for the Chinese. One person contracts COVID in an apartment, the whole building can be confined. 
The nightmare stories have been growing for months, from suicides to deaths in a bus that overturned carrying people to quarantine. The latest story is a fire last week. Ten people were killed and the lockdown is being blamed. The reports people couldn't get out quickly enough because they were confined. And reports firefighters were delayed by lockdown fencing. It's hard to know if either is true, but people identify with the victims. The fire that happened in Olomchi, in the westernmost part of the country, is resonated with people who live in Shanghai at the other end. The Chinese government Monday called the reports about the fire disinformation, smears spread on social media. Now, traditional media in China is tightly controlled. There are no mentions of the protests. But word has gotten out on social media. Posts are deleted by the government if they're about the protests, but that takes time. If they're up even for minutes, they can be seen. Proof that has happened is in a symbol that's been spread. Blank sheets of paper now represent defiance in cities across the country and with Chinese artists outside the country. Some analysts say the government can't let this go on for long. Oh, it's highly dangerous. I think we haven't really seen uh, the repressive apparatus fully engaged at this point, but unfortunately, I, I think that is what we're going to observe in the days and weeks to come. COVID rules may be the biggest part of what's going on, but there are also some openly criticizing the Communist Party and leader Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping! Now, the government could let some of the pressure out by relaxing COVID rules, but China has an aging population, low vaccination rates, and a less effective domestic vaccine. Opening up would mean other problems. Mike Armstrong, Global News. The unrest is having ripple effects. The stock market took a hit today. Investors worried about the Chinese economy and how the government will react to the protests. Oil prices have also dropped. They're now at an 11-month low, in part because of weak demand in China, which is the world's largest oil importer. Much rests on what happens there, and the idea that trade with the West would lead to social and political reform in China is now seen as naive. Canada is taking a new approach, looking at China as an increasingly disruptive global power. Mackenzie Gray explains Canada's strategy to shift away from Chinese dominance. A harsh rebuke of Canada from Beijing. Canada. A foreign affairs ministry spokesperson saying Canada's new Indo-Pacific strategy is full of ideological bias that makes unfounded accusations against China. But there will be things we will disagree on. The Liberals are no stranger to Chinese complaints. President Xi Jinping lectured Justin Trudeau this month at the G20 for sharing details of an earlier conversation, another sign of a faltering relationship with Canada's second largest trading partner. China will have more respect for Canada when we have a bigger presence uh, among its neighbors and uh, are seen to be players and making important contributions. A central part of this new plan, isolating China, who the government now says is a disruptive global power. The opposition is critical of the lack of specific details. Well, you know, my biggest concern is not whether or not it goes far enough. My biggest concern is whether or not there's actions that follow these words. The Liberals have put up $2.3 billion over five years to execute their plan, and one of the biggest financial commitments is boosting the Canadian military presence in the Indo-Pacific. Canada will now send three frigates to the region, but a senior government official told reporters today they don't know when in 2023 that will happen. Thank you. And to fill the space economically, the Liberals hope to increase trade with another superpower, India. And they're targeting completing an economic partnership agreement as their key goal. But it's a deal that Canada has been trying to complete since 2010, with negotiations last taking place over five years ago. India is an incredibly complex market. And our relationship with India is fraught at the present time and is difficult. Chinese interference in Canada is another important issue after Global News first reported that China allegedly spent nearly a quarter million dollars to fund 11 different candidates in the 2019 election. Canada's former ambassador to China believes the focus on Chinese interference is important, but action is needed. Canadians expect more in terms of uh, uh, what the government is going to do concretely to prevent interference in the political system. Asked how they would know if the new strategy would be successful, a senior government official told reporters today, Ottawa would gauge success based on strengthen and deepen relations with friendly Indo-Pacific countries, but couldn't provide any concrete benchmarks to measure that. Donna? All right, Mackenzie Gray in Ottawa, thanks. 
The former Hydro Quebec employee charged with spying for China was released on bail today. 35 year old Yu Shang Wang was arrested November 14th and has been held in police custody since then. He's the first person in Canada charged with economic espionage under the Security of Information Act. He also faces three charges for fraudulent use of a computer, obtaining a trade secret, and breach of trust. Wang was released on $200,000 bail and had to turn in his passport. He must carry a cell phone with geolocation turned on at all times. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau spent the day on the James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, a community that has much healing to do after the mass stabbing there in September. Prime Minister visited the graves where some of those killed were laid to rest. He was then welcomed in a grand entry ceremony and met with leaders and community members. Twelve people died, including the suspect who took his own life in police custody. Among those he killed was his own brother. Eighteen others in the close-knit community were injured during the attacks on September 4th. The horrific crime sparked new calls for more community support, addictions counselling and Indigenous-led policing. Nathaniel Dove is on the James Smith Cree Nation tonight. Nathaniel, the Prime Minister promised funding. What did he offer and what was the reaction? Donna, ever since the attacks, as you point out, there have been calls for change to prevent anything similar from ever happening again. Today, the Prime Minister announced around $60 million. $20 million of that will go towards a program to help end violence against Indigenous women and girls. About, around 2 and a half will go towards uh, providing addictions, access to addictions uh, treatment for, uh, that, is, that is traditionally uh, grounded in First Nations beliefs. And the largest amount, $60 million, will go towards a new treatment centre. We'll invest $40 million over six years to build a new wellness centre here in the community and to repurpose the existing Sakwatamo Lodge to address immediate needs. Today's announcement will enable James Smith Cree Nation to develop and design the programs that best serve the needs of its members. I asked an addictions counsellor here, James Smith, what he thought of the announcement. And not just an addictions counsellor, uh, Daryl Burns lost his sister in the attack, Gloria Lydia Burns. He grew very emotional when I asked him. He was saying, finally, people here at James Smith Cree Nation and hopefully in other First Nations can finally start passing on something good to, to their children and grandchildren, not just the hurt and the harm that they've, uh, that they've learned, that they've incorporated through alcohol and addictions. He says, though, there is a lot more work to be done. This funding expires, uh, it was only good for four to six years. There's a lot more work to be done further past that for the harm caused by residential schools. Now, I asked Chief Wally Burns for timelines with regards to the Wellness Centre and when this will start. Uh, he doesn't have any firm dates on that yet, but he did say progress starts today. Donna? All right, Nathaniel Dove on the James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. Thanks. Canada's newest member of the Supreme Court and first Indigenous Justice has been formally welcomed onto the country's top court. Michelle Obonsawan is a bilingual Franco-Ontarian and an Abenaki member of the Odanak First Nation. She says her journey has not been an easy one, but it's been meaningful and rewarding, and she hopes she's setting an example. I hope that my journey to this court will inspire young women to pursue their dreams. I am a big believer that if you have a goal, work hard and never give up, you can make things happen and achieve those dreams. Obonsawen's appointment to the Supreme Court has been praised by Indigenous leaders nationwide as a step towards reconciliation and balancing the membership of the court. On a wing and a prayer coming up, the small plane dangling in high voltage power lines for hours. Hawaii's Mauna Loa volcano, the world's largest active volcano, has woken up. It is erupting for the first time since 1984. The U.S. Geological Survey says the volcanic activity began late Sunday night. The lava flows are contained right now, posing no immediate threat to nearby communities. Scientists are waiting to see if it develops into a rift zone eruption, which would make it significantly easier for magma to emerge. 
A few frightening hours in Maryland when a small plane crashed into high voltage power lines and then dangled for six hours. The pilot and passenger were alive but hanging about 30 meters in the air. Emergency crews had to make sure there was no electricity in the lines before using a crane to rescue them. Both people were taken to hospital with trauma injuries and hypothermia and power was out to 120,000 customers. An avowed white supremacist has pleaded guilty to 10 counts of first-degree murder for the mass shooting in May at a supermarket in a predominantly black neighborhood of Buffalo, New York. Police say Peyton Gendron, Gendron, who was 18 years old at the time, left a racist manifesto online before the attack and he live streamed the shooting on social media. He also pleaded guilty to attempted murder and domestic terrorism charges. He faces a mandatory sentence of life in prison without parole. He's still facing more than two dozen federal charges, some which carry the death penalty. Discrimination allegation ahead of human rights complaint against the Vancouver Canucks launched by a former employee. A former member of the Vancouver Canucks coaching staff is alleging she was discriminated against. She was fired in September and has now filed a complaint with the BC Human Rights Tribunal. Neetu Garcha reports. The Canucks have had their fair share of challenges on the ice this season, and now the franchise is facing a very different problem off the ice. The Canucks were putting a lot of pressure on me to not go public. This is Rachel Dory, former Canucks analyst and assistant video coach. After less than a year, the team parted ways with her in September, leaving many wondering why. There was no reason given for my dismissal publicly. Now Dory has filed a complaint with the BC Human Rights Tribunal alleging she was fired because of her mental illness and physical disability, pointing to a heart condition she suffers from and claiming she disclosed her struggles with anxiety attacks and depression to the Canucks while interviewing for the job. I want people who have mental illnesses and physical disabilities to not be looked down upon. Dory's claims are targeted at a high-profile and respected executive, Canucks assistant GM Emily Castungay. Dory says she was promoted, but before the Canucks organization announced it, a reporter and friend of hers wrote this news article about her promotion. The article features praise from Canucks head coach Bruce Boudreau. Dory posted the article on her personal social media and claims she was then called to a meeting with Castungay, who Dory alleges told her, you're not important enough to be cared about, and I don't know if you have what it takes to do the job mentally. Stories of racism in hockey, uh, stories of sexual assault in hockey, there's just too many stories. In a statement, Castungay says Dory's claims are, quote, absolutely not true, and her allegations of what I said to her are false and inaccurate. The Canucks organization also issuing a statement saying we acted in good faith and abided by our contractual obligations, both during and after her employment. I don't think anybody expected uh, Emily or the Canucks to come out and say, yeah, we did it. Um, so for me, this was kind of par for the course. Dory, who also spent a year and a half as a video analyst with the New Jersey Devils, is also asking the tribunal to order the Canucks to compensate her. Neetu Garcha, Global News, Vancouver. Here's a sign of the times. Merriam-Webster has chosen gaslighting as the word of the year. It has, according to the dictionary, become the favored word for the perception of deception. Gaslighting is the act or practice of grossly misleading someone, especially for one's own advantage. Lookups of the word increased almost 2,000% this year compared to 2021. The word comes from a 1938 British stage play, later adapted into a movie. A deceitful husband drives his wife to near insanity by convincing her she's a kleptomaniac and that she has only imagined the sounds in the attic and the dimming of the gaslights in their house. Turning thoughts into action next, how mind control technology is transforming lives. The ability to control electronic devices with your mind still sounds like the stuff of science fiction. But the ability to detect electrical activity in the brain through the scalp and to control it is beginning to transform medicine and change society in profound ways. Heather Urex West reports on what researchers in Alberta are doing to help children with complex physical needs operate all sorts of devices with just a thought. Can you make it go? A year ago, Claire Sonnenberg entered a new world. One where she can turn on a blender or play a game using her thoughts alone. 
It was one of the best feelings I think I, I could have had for her, and her smile just said it all. Claire was born with cerebral palsy. She's not able to speak, and a lot of movements are challenging as well. But thanks to brain-computer interface technology and the Think to Switch, a new device developed by researchers at the universities of Calgary and Alberta, Claire's mind is learning to operate new games and devices all the time. Claire um, has a mix master and she can use it so she can, um, she does all the mixing, the boys add the ingredients, she can do pasta making, um, she plays video games. The technology translates thoughts into action using a headset placed on a child's head. When someone like Claire thinks about a movement, in her case kicking her foot, a part of her brain is activated. The sensor reads the message and the Think to Switch device activates a connected application like a light switch or a command in a video game. It can control many, many things. Um, the assistive technology world has created a lot of switch adapted toys and it can even be used for power mobility. While it may seem like science fiction, BCI or brain computer interface technology is nothing new, but its applications for children with complex physical needs have come a long way in the last decade alone. For one, headsets are now widely available commercially at a cost of about a grand, with applications like the Think to Switch letting kids practice these new brain skills every day. Part of what's exciting about working with kids is that they have the ability to really um, learn this technology in a, a way that you and I might struggle some with, and it gives them opportunities to develop in a lot of ways that they see their, their peers developing. When we can, can you know, communicate through play and games, it's a, it's a new world for us. And with hopes for this technology to help Claire with mobility and communication in the future, the possibilities in this new world seem limitless. Heather Urex West, Global News, Calgary. And that is Global National for this Monday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is Apsley, Ontario. We'd love to see Your Canada. Please email it to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Bye-bye.